Okay, welcome back to Practice Underwater. This is our part two interview with Frank. If you haven't listened to part one, please go back. I will give a little uh, recap in the interview. We have George back. He's still in the parents' bedroom. How are you doing, George? We got to keep talking about this. Can yeah, we, it's really enjoyable to me. Can I don't we know. just move on? I well, come down to see my parents for a couple of days, trying to be a nice no, son here, and, and now I just can't hear the end of it on the show. Listen, I'm just sad that I can't go to my parents' bedroom because they moved, and I'll never be able to recapture that moment, and here you are in the moment, and it's just giving me a little jealousy. Oh, my gosh. All right. Well, let's hop into the interview. I don't have anything to add other than I think part one was – you know, Matt, actually, I do want to add something. This was these two interviews, so part one last week and part one this week. I listened to these in the car. So we have our podcast producer, John, gets them to us, and I listen to them in the car. And every once in a while, Matt makes a point, and I just like round of applause, scream, <laughs> clap. I get very excited, you know, probably more than the average listener listening to the show. And th- I thought you killed this one. This was, to date, in my opinion, your best practice underwater part one part two it was you know in part two it really shows because there's just certain things that there's certain points that you make that are i could you know we've done a lot of growing as coaches in shared practices as we've worked with more clients we have more data we look at more analytics and you and i become more in line because we view the same data and we make the same decisions and so it this shows and so i i just want to say that our audience if you listened to part one and you thought Matt did a great job, I think part two is even better. And, um, you know, I, I, I really enjoyed your insight here. I thought it was spot on. That's very nice of you to say. Thank you, George. Appreciate You're that. You're welcome. All right. We'll hop right in. Yep. All right. We are back with our fake name, real guest, Frank. Uh, if you haven't listened to part one from last week, go back and listen. Just to give everyone a quick recap, Frank graduated about four or five years ago. He worked for a couple jobs, uh, one in a fee-for-service office and then another in a more corporate setting. He found this office on a Dentaltown classified ad uh, of a doc who was just looking to retire and walk away. Uh, My personal favorite type of deal. This is my favorite. Um, So he took over this office a couple years ago. He has seen uh, some nice growth with the office. He's grown 20% to where he's doing just over $500,000 in collections. He's got a smaller space right now. It's currently outfitted for three ops. Uh, he has space for the fourth. It's been plumbed. Um, he's got his wife working at the front, a full-time assistant and hygienist. Um, we talked last time a bit about um, some of his staffing needs and how he could definitely use another assistant and hygienist. Um, got into some things about his marketing and his quality of new patients. Um, and then also about outf- outfitting that fourth op. Um So we'll welcome back on Frank. Frank, how are you? Doing good. Good. So we got um, your numbers up from January. I noticed you took a couple days off in February, so I figured this will give a more accurate view of, you know, how you guys are doing. Um, I wanted to talk briefly. um, You mentioned to me off air that you had a consultant when you first bought the practice. So I'm curious to hear how your experience was with him or her and um, kind of how that all went. Okay. Uh, so I got introduced to the consultant through a friend of mine who's a pediatric dentist that had been using them for a little while. Um, they're a larger company. I probably won't say the names, but, um, you know, unless we want to, I don't really care, but, um, I, uh, so I was using them before I bought the practice and they sort of were helping with the transition. So, I kept them on for uh, about a year after I bought the practice. And, you know, I think that they did do some things beneficial as far as helping with um, some of the changes in the office, as far as uh, staffing. Uh, We had a, a girl at the front that had been in the practice for about 11 years when I bought the practice. And, she was really great with the patients, not so great, like with, you know, the business stuff. But, um, after a while I find out that, you know, when she would come in, we were originally working three days, three days a week. And she would come in the Wednesday when we were closed to work on catch up on stuff. Well, I found out that she was basically altering her hours. So, um, I had to let her go. 
And so, you know, after that, that's when I brought my wife into the practice. Um, so they were very helpful, I guess, in the initial stages. Um, they kind of connected me with the banker, you know, the banker, uh, Bank of America banker, and, you know, just helped to sort of give me some guidance through that process of the transition, uh, how I should tell the staff, um, you know, introduce myself, things like that. But for what I was paying them, I don't know if it was, if it was worth it just because when I, I mean, when I look back at how much I paid during that time, you know, it was a lot. So yeah. Like that. What was, I'm just curious, what, like, what was the format of the consulting? Was it them giving you, you know, written stuff to get, or they would like talk yeah. to you and have you implemented? How did that work? So this is a, uh, I'll just say it's like a franchise of uh, coaches basically. And they have, uh, they would have a coach come in monthly and do like a monthly meeting with the team. And then they would have like, I'd say like quarterly sort of meetings where they would get everybody together and do like a quarterly meeting type thing. Um, and then you had like their phone calls and stuff like that as well. So, um, so I wouldn't say it, it wasn't, you know, I definitely got some benefit from it, but you know, as far as the, the value, I thought it was, it was a little bit expensive. And the thing that I didn't really like about them was that they had never been dentists before. So I felt like they didn't really understand a lot of times, like how difficult it was to juggle everything. Uh, whereas if I went back in the past, I maybe would have gone with somebody that, uh, that had some, that was a dentist previously or, or currently, and that, that has more experience, like actually doing walking the, the talk, you know, mm -hmm. what, what did, what did you want? Like more of looking back on it that they didn't give. Um, I would say like they would, they would come into the office sometimes. And I thought that was good. Like what I got, I think what I got the most benefit was from like when my, my wife joined the practice, like they had somebody come in and sort of train her on like how to run the, like how to, the office should be run and stuff like that. So I felt like that was the most beneficial, but you know, sometimes I felt like they, we they would do a meeting with the team and they would not you know, maybe be as prepared as I would have liked to. And, you know, um, so, you know, those are some of the things I guess that, you know, I guess mm -hmm. I wish I would have got a little bit more out of them. Yeah. I see the benefit of like strict consultants is like, um, they provide a lot of knowledge. Like mm -hmm. they'll give like for like your wife, a staff member maybe doesn't know a lot about dentistry. Mm -hmm. And now how do you turn that person into a manager, or, you know, mm -hmm. front desk, whatever their title is mm -hmm. like, that's where I see value in them. Um, where I see a lot of the breakdowns is in the kind of implementation of everything. Like they'll give you the resources, but how well they handhold you or guide you through the implementation of it all is kind of where I see it break down for a lot of people I've talked to. Mm -hmm. yeah, is that kind of your experience? Yeah, I would agree. So they, they know the, like the book knowledge, I guess, but they don't necessarily like, I guess, know how it works in the real world sort of. Mm -hmm. They wear suits. Some sometimes. <laughs> Gosh. Gosh, that's awful. <laughs> um, and and through that time, you were working with with Dental Intel. Um, so talk to me about you know how you were able to use that software and the reason kind of you now chosen to go without any. So they were uh, basically paying for Dental Intel, so it was part of the the service. Um, so. We use the we use the morning huddle feature a little bit, um, which uh, you know we did probably didn't use it to the, the capability that it had. But to me, I, I sort of get there like ten minutes early, and I just pull I pull the you know yesterday's production today you know collect production collections where we're at for the month new patients. I end up just pulling all that and putting it together on my own sheet, um, but. You know, the things I guess that were cool about it um, were the, the case acceptance, because that's a little bit harder to um, calculate. Um, for a while, I was kind of keeping track of it myself, and it was just kind of, it was, you know, very difficult to, to do for a long time. Um, and then the, uh, like the production um uh, Recall percentage, I guess, is another one that's a little harder to calculate yourself. But 
for most of the basic reports, I find that open, I have open dental and it, mm-hmm. I felt like for what I was paying, uh, that it, I wasn't getting enough, uh, extra value from it, I guess. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, I'll, I'll get working on converting. <laughs> <to PDF. laughs> all right. <laughs> uh, all right. So we got your numbers up from January. I want to, I want to talk about kind of the most glaring issue I see uh, with this practice is the hygiene department. Uh, the, the practice, how you're operating now is very much doctor dependent. Uh, your hygiene percentage for this month was just about 18%. Um, and her, her hourly and daily are definitely on the low end of the spectrum, you know, partially due to kind of what we said last time about your heavy insurance write-offs. Um, but talk to me a bit about your hygiene department, kind of where you see the opportunities are for growth there. Yeah. So like you were saying with the write-offs and stuff, I think we are, you know, that was another thing that I, I didn't really realize, I guess, when I bought the practice, but you know, I know we talked about, people talked about in the past. Now it's getting to be more known, but the doctor was on the Delta premier. And when I bought the practice, I was only, uh, uh, basically not grandfathered in. So I had to join the PPO or, or nothing. And so, you know, we're on Delta PPO now, which I think pays about $50 of cleaning or something. So, you know, that's like, it's like cleaning an exam, like 50 something dollars. So, uh, you know, it's very hard to run a profitable hygiene department, but, um, one thing I, I don't know if it has on here, we, we have been offering like the fluoride and things like that to, and we did keep our fluoride like lower cost, I guess. Um, so we offer like fluoride for $20, $20 if they, um, it used to be 15. Um, and then, so we get, we get, you know, some patients that do that, um, trying to get patients if, if they need scaling, you know, scaling definitely helps out increase in the, uh, increase in the hygiene's production, but we're also spending like some, you know, we, we, we try and do an hour for new patient on the hygiene side and 30 minutes on my side. So if it's like a group on patient that, you know, say we run a group on deal for a hundred dollars, we might only get, you know, $45 or something or $50 of collections from that. And so I'm paying a a hygienist for that hour and, you know, it's, you barely covering her, uh, payroll, you know? Yeah. I mean, that's, that's definitely one of the downfalls of it. And, you know, I think most doctors would be okay with that if they were, um, pretty well guaranteed it was going to be a high quality patient. Yeah. Like, mm-hmm. I mean, people spend a lot of marketing to get really good patients. And if that was, you know, what you got reimbursed for a really good patient, it's worth it. But mm-hmm. you know, the realities of, of Groupon, um, are just that it's, it's not that patient, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, one, one thing I like in your hygiene department currently, you are doing a very healthy amount of perio. So I think that's, that's one thing you're, you're right in line with kind of where an office should be. You're at 21% for this month, uh, which is great m- more than most people, I would say. Um, you definitely could be doing a better job pre-appointing your most months you're in the mid seventies, which is decent. It's not terrible. Um, but for an established office, you can definitely get that 85 plus. Uh, and that would help with some of the kind of patient flow issues we pointed to last episode. Um, and with the fluoride too, there's definitely an opportunity. Um, it's great that you're offering it. Um, she did 6% last month, which is still, you know, pretty low. Mm -hmm. Um, I think, you know, especially with these, you know, with these lower reimbursing insurances, it's super important to have those adjunct services. And, um, I also wanted to ask you, what are you guys doing now as far as like maximizing insurance breakdowns? How is that handled? So we, uh, recently, basically we're putting all the insurance information into open dental. Um, so you click on the insurance tab and there'll be notes on there. Uh, my wife's been trying to put notes in there as far as like night guard covered ortho coverage, um, you know, things like that, to where we can tell patients like, Oh, you have wear on your teeth. Like, oh, look, you have night guard coverage. That makes them more likely to, to go forward with that treatment, um, or at least to hear you out more on it. Um, so we've been trying to, uh, and and recently I I kind of asked to start putting it on the appointment note, like so that I can um, 
when I when I look at the schedule for that day, I can see like, okay, what patients have ortho coverage, what patients have night guard coverage, um, so that I can just talk to them about those, you know, services. Nice. One thing you could do, which I actually learned from one of our guests, Dr. Sarah, is you can put um, kind of like how you do a medical alert, like the little red mm -hmm. writing right on their oh, name. Okay. You can like put like a O for has ortho coverage or like an N for night guard or I don't know, I for implants. And that way, like it's right there. Every time they book an appointment, you can see mm -hmm. you know, without even having to click on anything. So I've, I've stolen that from Dr. Sarah. <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, how, how about like doing all the covered x-rays and everything how are you guys with that um we recently had uh my my henry shine rep did a practice analysis with henry shine their version of it and he said that we were doing very well with that that we were pretty much almost 100 percent our x-rays were current so i feel like we do a really good job keeping track of that and getting x-rays when needed mm -hmm. yeah i mean with being so insurance driven, it's so important to do everything you can. Like, you know, I, I see a lot of patients in my office who get, ex get our covered bite wings every six months, mm -hmm. which is something, you know, for you is so important to take advantage of, mm -hmm. you know, with the, with the fees you're reduced to. Um, so I think, you know, it's a combination of getting some more fluoride, continuing to do all the x-rays you can and pre-pointing a little better. But ultimately, like what's going to make the biggest difference for you is getting another column. Yeah, like that's that's just what you need. Yeah. Because um, if I take that, if if the second hygienist does what the first hygienist did, you said I was what eighteen percent hygiene. Yeah. So I'd really only need another like ten percent or so to be in line. Yeah. yeah. Maybe I mean, and your line. your production would definitely go up from it as well. Yeah. That's you true. know, probably putting you more in the normal healthy range of the twenty five percent. Mm -hmm. um, that, that kind of you're looking for um how is this hygienist as far as um telling treatment for you she's she's pretty good uh she talks to the patients about you know actually i've been i've been she's getting better um she's only second year out of school so i feel like when she first joined the practice she was a little tentative talking to patients about treatment but lately i've been telling her like you see something when you're cleaning, take an enteral picture of it because we have the the mouthwash cameras. Take a picture of it and talk to the patient about it and tell them what I'm going to, you know, possibly recommend. And so I feel like lately she, she's been uh, doing really well with that. The other thing that we, we've implemented lately that's that's helped out a lot is we've been using uh, Slack, that um, text messaging service. And so everybody has a – we have a Slack chat on the, in the office – and she'll type in what she sees so that I can just look at that or I can get an alert on my watch. And then before I go in the room, I know, you know, number 18, clues will check it out. And so when I go in the room, you know, I can talk to the patient about that. Um, so that's that's been helpful. Nice. So she's she's been now pretty good with taking all the pictures, mm -hmm. talking about it, and then yeah. alerting you to it? Yeah, just with, probably within the last, like, month or two. Yeah. Have you seen kind of the difference in that? way yeah. of operating yeah definitely i've i've noticed a big difference and i told her that it it's so much easier for me to go in there and do an exam knowing that she's already brought this up to the patient and so you know it's not like it it's a complete surprise when i come in there and tell them they got something wrong with them yeah it's so it's so powerful it's probably like the as far as cake acceptance the biggest lever you can mm -hmm. turn is that hygiene co-diagnosis with the pictures talking about the solutions you get in there and then you're just confirming mm -hmm. and then your job is so much easier sometimes um, when you when they just look at the picture they they want to do it they don't even they don't even know they just yeah think, oh, that's that's so ugly you know <laughs> i know i that's really like they're always their reaction is how ugly everything is <laughs> i guess when you're not used to looking at teeth everything right, seems right. like <laughs> ugly and when it's blown up that big like my i think my screen's like 56 inches it's that's, enormous <laughs> it's yeah, right in front of their face i need to get one of those i guess <laughs> Um, do they, ha is there some screen in front of them or do they have to like um, turn around? And so we have the, the computer screen that's like kind of to the, to the side in the corner. Mm -hmm. And so they can see that they can you know, see it on it's there. not like it's, it's not super close to their face, but, mm -hmm. um, okay. That's all I have with hygiene. I think there's, you know, there's a big opportunity for growth there, both in the second column and 
you know, uh, improving the performance, even with the one you have currently. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, that's at the end of the day, that's your, that's your clearest path towards a more higher producing office is right. through hygiene and everything that comes through you will just be, be a, uh, byproduct of just more exams and better performance. Mm-hmm. Um, so on your end, um, you're doing a lot of, a lot of good stuff on your diagnosing end, your, your treatment plan size is big um you're diagnosing on 60 percent of your patients which is on the very high end um you could you know your your case acceptance is kind of like pretty good it definitely could be improved mm-hmm. um you know we like we always say like maybe 50 percent of your crowns are are scheduled about 80 percent of your fillings you're probably more like 40 percent of crowns 70 percent of fillings so you're mm-hmm. you know pretty good but definitely could could even mm-hmm. jump up to mm-hmm. The optimal levels and i think once you kind of get that you know more reps with the hygienist now code diagnosing that will naturally increase mm-hmm. so i don't have i mean i don't have a lot of observations there i think you have a great mix of treatment that you offer um you know you're not just strict crown and bridge you also you know do, do endo you offer it ortho you're, you're doing removable like you're doing a lot of a variety of things which i think is always healthy to see too um I know you mentioned you took an implant course. Do you have plans on bringing implant placements in? Yes. That's another thing that I've basically been kind of delaying on, but I need to get the implant motor um, in the surgical kit. So it's probably going to be about maybe six grand or so to get all that stuff. Um, So I've just been kind of delaying it, but... (laughs) Hmm. What is, uh, how is like the need for that treatment in your office with your patients? Um, we do a fair bit of it. I won't like, I probably restore maybe one or two implant crowns a month. It's not like, not like a whole lot, but you know, um, I feel like if I was, maybe if I was offering it like all in one office, I might see a jump or raise up, but, um, but normally you know, about one or two cases a month. It's not a crazy amount. So is the only thing stopping you from, like you have you have all the training and knowledge you feel like to offer it? Yeah, I mean, I could always get more, but I, I feel like I could probably start with like a simple case. Uh, I don't have a comb beam here, um, so I would probably need to like refer out for that, but I could still... You know, I know we have a dental school here. I could refer them to dental school for, or there's specialists, I think, that have cone beams that sometimes you can refer to. So um, I guess the biggest thing is just getting the get, getting the motor and then feeling the confidence to, like, place my first one. And then I guess after that, then I'll, you know, feel more confident placing and talking to patients about it. What's it going to take for you to invest in that? Well, I just bought the the X ray, and uh, just with all the the uncertainty with the coronavirus thing, I'm kind of hesitant on spending any money right now. But I mean, it's, I guess once I pay once I pay off the X ray machine, then I can probably you know invest in the uh, the implant motor. But I don't know. I feel like like maybe I am slowing you know my growth down because I'm more Dataverse, but trying to just uh kind of like do things as i'm able to buy them yeah i mean um definitely understand in this time like the thought of spending that money on you know when who knows when you're back in the office working is the smart thing to do uh-huh. um i do you know some feedback for you that data version definitely will slow growth mm-hmm. and that's not to say it's wrong you know if if that's what you feel comfortable doing and that's, you know, you're okay with the effects of that, of that your growth will be slower. Mm -hmm. That's fine. But if you're, you know, if you find, you know, that you're really committed to getting where you want quicker, Mm -hmm. you need to get over that and kind of be okay with more of it. Mm -hmm. Um, Not to say go crazy by a $60,000 CPCT (laughs) and a huge, you know, like not go nuts with it, but like that, that mode of operating will slow you because for sure. I mean, the way I'm thinking about it too, is that if I get say two to three implants, if I place two or three implants, I just paid for all that, you know, the equipment basically. Yeah. Paid for it all. And then 
that's all done. And, and, and now you just have it. After that is is basically profitable. Yeah. Um, so I mean, that would it would be such a nice bump for your production to have an extra three four k on your side. Mm-hmm. Um, and not to mention how fun it is to do. At least in my opinion, I think <laughs> that's the best thing in dentistry. Um, so I think like you know, once the desk settles from all this, I think your staff changes are first, and you know, then thinking more, what kind of different marketing could we do? And then once kind of get some of that figured out, like get, get this in place and mm-hmm. get it, get it offered. Cause you definitely will see more of a need and demand for it. Yeah. Once you're offering it yourself. Yeah. I mean, if, if even thinking about doing um, like learning how to do uh, braces, I don't know if you've heard about ortho brain or anything like that. Mm-mm. So they like, it's, Basically, they help you with the diagnosing and uh, and overseeing the case, and then you and your dental assistant basically put the braces on, monitor the patient, uh, retainers, and um, and so that's something I'm considering offering. You know, as an additional way to increase production in the office, it's additional service. We're not. I mean, we're offering Invisalign now, but you know, that could be even like the the younger patients that you know are more interested in that. Uh, that could be like just another additional production, you know, that would give a boost uh, to the office. Mm-hmm. What, how does that work? Is that like a case fee you pay them? Yeah, it's kind of like Invisalign. So, uh, yeah, basically they, they send you a kit with all the, you know, the setup that you need. And then, um, you basically, after you paid them their fee, they, they stay with the case through the life of the case. What is their fee? Uh, I think for braces it's about twelve hundred. Okay. And then do you do, see like a they'll do of they'll teenagers? Do, they'll do Invisalign if you if you want them to basically do your clin check and everything like that for you, they could do that for I think four or five hundred. But to do me, you I, see a lot of teenagers? Uh, we see a lot of families, but not you know I would say not a crazy amount, but I feel like that since I bought the practice, we've been getting more more younger people coming in, um, more, more families. Um, so it's not, I would say not a whole, it was definitely probably, I would say an older practice when I bought it demographic wise, but it's, it's starting to get more younger as you know, we've been doing more marketing and stuff. I guess I don't see that one as much because it would make sense to me if the case fee was like substantially lower than Invisalign and then you were taking home more profit from it. But I mean, you can get Invisalign Go for that twelve hundred range, or yeah. you could use, you know, Sure Smile does comprehensive for twelve hundred. That's true. Um, yeah. So, so if you're just saying like a liner, you're pretty much capturing that same market with a liner. So no. Re- yeah. I mean, you even hear from a lot of orthodontists that they're even doing Invisalign on teenagers, on teenagers like yeah. you know. Um, so I don't know. So, I, so you I don't think know if it, I see that it, so much. You think the implant motor would be the the first one to add? Yeah, I mean, because you're you're doing most, most everything else, you know, other than like the sleep TMJ full month rehab stuff, Mm -hmm. but that's obviously much more expensive to learn and requires a lot more knowledge. And, you know, it comes with more, I don't know, risk. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, I I definitely see that as like your next big clinical offering that you, that you bring on. Yeah. That sounds good. Um, all right, let's get into some other stuff. So, your recall current percentage is pretty good. It's the number of people who are current on the recall. You're at 63.5%. That's in a pretty good range. You know, you probably could raise that a little higher in the 60s, but that kind of caps at about 70 um, for almost all offices. Um, so have you? how do you handle kind of overdue patients? Is that something you task your wife with? How does that work? Well, we have solution reach, so I do pay for that. Um, I kind of consider that like a marketing expense, I guess. Uh, but it'll send a text message when they're overdue, and then we'll um, we'll normally run that, that the recall reports, and I'll have either my my wife call them, or sometimes a hygienist if she has downtime, just calling patients to get them back on the schedule. Um, but a lot of it's automated, I guess, with the with the reminders. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think you're. You're doing a pretty good job with it. I think keeping with the phone calls once the reminders don't work. Mm-hmm. 
is always, is always a good healthy practice, even for someone who's in a pretty good range for this. Um, you know, the numbers definitely show you are growing practice. Like you, you net gained about 150 or so for the last year. Um, so it definitely shows out that like you bought it at six, 700 patients and now you're increasing every year, which mm-hmm. is honestly better than most practices. I see okay. most are net losing patients per month. Okay. Um, you know, it's a little bit um, dicey with the with the Groupon because, you know, a lot of those people are, you know, might not come back. Mm-hmm. Um, so it could be a little misleading with that number. Um, but I think generally you're in the right trend. Um, I just, yeah, with the Groupon, I don't know. I just, I don't know if I see it. I don't know if I see it. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. That's, I'll leave that for you to decide what to do with that. <laughs> um your AR is pretty good. I mean, you got some decent 90 day, but your AR days are 28, which is in a great range. So, you know, you probably have some bad, bad debt out there, mm-hmm. but I don't think it's anything you're not. Yeah. You know, I think your, your policies and your collection policies are, are right where they should be. So I don't see any issues with kind of how you're collecting money. Mm-hmm. Um, anything jump out to you kind of when you look at these numbers? Um, not offhand. It, you know, looks pretty much what I expected, I guess. You're doing a, a lot of same day treatment for one assistant, which is really nice to see. Like uh, you did 23,000 of gross production this month in the same day. Like that's really good, uh, especially with one assistant. Uh huh. Yeah. That's um, what, uh, I think that's what that second assistant would be able to, because my, my assistant is really good. She will, yeah. And I, I do have like the isolite which is pretty helpful. Mm-hmm. So if I can get the patient numb, I'll set up the isolite. She can hop out, flip the next room, set up the next patient. So we have a good flow, but I mean, I'll, sometimes I'll be like in there by myself. So it's not ideal, you know, but, uh, mm-hmm. but it, it's definitely lower overhead, I guess. But like you said, the staff isn't that expensive where I live. So. It would yeah. I mean, good. even if you didn't, even if you didn't raise production with another assistant, I doubt that would even really change your staff percentage that much. You know, mm-hmm. it's just so, it's so reasonable where you are, mm-hmm. um, which is, which is great. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. I mean, that's, that's kind of most of what I, I saw looking at your numbers. I mean, it just, it just very much screams doctor dependent, uh, high insurance write-offs, mm-hmm. you know, some, some knobs that can definitely be turned mm-hmm. like the, pre-appointment di- uh, treatment or case acceptance getting a little higher and the hygienist being so low producing. Mm-hmm. Um, I think, I think are always the, the biggest, biggest kind of growth areas for you. Um, I think it's key, you know, even when for people listening, looking at these numbers, it's, you don't want to, you know, you want to have focus with it. You don't want to try to do seven different things at once, you know, focus on the biggest issue and that's going to move you the furthest and then get that under control and then go to the next one. Like that's kind of how this all should be approached. Um, anything else you wanted to mention before we kind of wrap up? No, I was just set, second what you were saying. And I, I'm definitely guilty of that because, you know, I, I'm always reading or listening to something and then I'll go, you know, come to my team with, you know, five, six different ideas. And it's like, mm-hmm. sometimes I feel like you can overload them and, lose focus on, you know, let's go ahead and pick this first and then let's go ahead and finish this. And then, so I, I think I'm more the, um, I guess if you talk about the, the traction, there's the integrator and what was the, the other one? Uh, the visionary. The visionary. I'm more the visionary, which is why it kind of helps. Uh, I think my, my wife's more the integrator. So I'll just throw a lot of things, but I won't finish a lot of things. So it helps that, you know, I have, you know, some people reeling me back in and, and kind of making sure that all of this actually gets, gets implemented. But, well, I mean, that's good that you realize that about yourself. Cause I think like you want to spend most of your time in the stuff that like your unique ability, like that's where you want to be doing most of your stuff during your week is like, what do I do best? What do only I can do? And then the other things, what can I delegate to staff or whoever that maybe they do better or like that, you know, like you said, that you're not that implementer type. You're more like, all right, what's the vision? What's the big plan? What's the big idea? Right. Like, so I think like for you, 
concentrating on focusing on doing that stuff. Surrounding yourself with people that are more implementers. Yeah. And it sounds like, you know, maybe by chance, that's kind of how, how it happened for yeah. you. Um, so what, what, you know, obviously a lot of these actions are going to be dependent on, you know, when this all clears. Um, but what are you kind of taking away from our talk and that, you know, how you see yourself implementing some of this stuff going forward? Yeah, it's funny because we, we talked about like writing down the goals and, you know, I do write down my goals at the beginning of the year and check on, check in on them. And pretty much everything that you mentioned was on my, on my goals for this year, hire a second dental assistant, hire a second hygienist, build out the fourth op, buy implant motor. Like these are all things that I'm aware of. It's just now actually like, how do I actually go out and do those things? Yeah. I mean, they say like the breakdown, if you have a breakdown, it's either a failure in planning or a failure in execution. And it sounds like for you, it's not the planning. Right. I, it's know the execution. What I, I know what I need to do. I just haven't, you know, it's just doing it, I guess. Yeah. So like, what's going to make the difference for you as far as it, like actually doing some of yeah. these plans? Well, I mean, I think the, what you were saying as far as getting through your, your mental I guess mental blocks as far as like you just made it make more sense with the hygienist. Like if she sees three patients, she covers her salary with the dental, with the dental assistant, even if you don't increase production, you're still doing okay with salary wise with the, the operatory. If you can stretch a note out for five years, what's your monthly payment on that? How much monthly, you know, production are you going to increase by having that fourth fourth op? So, you know, the implant motor, how many cases do you need to do before it's paid off? I mean, those are pretty much pretty much the only blocks that I that I have. So it's just basically looking at the numbers and being like, okay, well, this makes sense logically, you know. <laughs> just Yeah. You know, like, you know, you know reframing them. They're not like costs, they're they're investments. Yeah. They're investments in getting this practice to where you want. And you know, nothing you won't get anything in life without making the sacrifice. Like you're not going to get to a million dollars without making sacrifices and taking risks. And, you know, they're all calculated risks and, um, you know, kind of best practices, but they are still risks and they are still sacrifices. So, you know, it's about kind of being okay with that mm-hmm. and um, seeing, you know, seeing the end game and the reasons why you're doing it. That kind of allows you to get over that. Yeah. Um, well, thank you so much, Frank. I mean, you you gave me something to do while I'm stuck at home, so I always appreciate that. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> glad hopefully so, I could uh, you know help somebody out that's uh, in a similar situation. Yeah, I mean, it's always you know I'm I'm certainly biased to solo offices, and it's it's um, you know this this is a very like typical office that you'd see you know that you see for sale or that you'd hear about people like in that kind of production range in that kind of space you know. Um, you're in a doctor's row in your, in your area. Um, so it's nice, nice to, you know, we, we hear a lot about George's, you know, big group practices, biases towards that. I like to get back to kind of the more normal, you know, what most practices are like yeah. out there. So sure. um, thank you for, for opening up to everything and um, really appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. I hope you guys enjoyed that part two with Frank. George is back with us and he, as a couple of topics he'd like to discuss, first of which, George, I think you're, you've, you know, you've been, we've been looking at a lot of data, as you mentioned um, in the intro, and that's given us a lot more information to work with. And you've made an interesting discovery as far as new patients and how um, maybe people were looking at this, you know, in, they could be looking at it in a different way. So why don't you go into that? So I think a little bit of context for our audience would be important. So we are in the process right now of scaling our coaching. And we are looking to grow beyond Matt and I. And in that process, we have to standardize the way we do things. And so my role in this whole process is to use the data we have from our clients to inform and to mine that data for insight so that we can better help our clients make better decisions. That's one thing that we feel makes us very different and you know a competitive advantage for our clients that they have using us. And one thing that we find is when we look at production per patient as a metric, and we look at what are the things that drive that number, the quality of new patient is the most important, statistically speaking, when we look at the analytics, the biggest driver 
of that stat, production per patient, is your ability to get high quality new patients. And so the quantity of new patients is it not nearly as important. The I have so many different factors that you would think would impact that number are not nearly as important as the quality of new patient that we can test using our data. And so that's something that we've discovered and we've pivoted the way we market and everything towards that. And, you know, my practice has seen tremendous growth since. And so the whole Groupon thing is the exact opposite of that. You get a really high quantity new patient, very, very low quantity. And when you test it and you look at the data, you'll see the value of that new patient visit and the value. So there's this stat that we look at, treatment accepted per new patient exam. So how much treatment did they schedule per new patient exam? And in the Groupon patient, you're going to see an incredibly low treatment accepted per new patient exam, and you're going to see an incredibly low uh, new patient pre-appointment rate. So the number of patients that are reappointing. So you you talked about 50% of his patients are reappointing. And my guess is that Groupon percentage is like 20, 30%. And so it's knocking down that whole stat for him. And the Groupon is so, and can I, Matt, can I rant about other issues the Groupon is causing in his practice? Let me ask you one question before you do that. Sure. So yeah, you measure the quality of a new patient based on the dollar amount of treatment accepted per exam? Is that Correct. what you Correct, and at? that's not a PBN stat. So practice by numbers does not keep that stat. That is something that for our clients we extract and then we we deliver, or we are in the process of delivering that directly to clients. Yet Right now it's internal only. So mm-hmm. that is a very cutting edge stat that we look at and that's our way of assessing. So two ways of assessing quality um, is the, you know, the number of patients that reschedule and ultimately the, the number of, tre- the amount of treatment you get from those patients. So in both instances, he is showing very low quality new patients. And the impact that has is drastic because right now, right, what is he dealing with? He's dealing with hygiene booked out three weeks. He can't get pe- enough people into hygiene and he's slow on his side. I would I would argue Groupon has everything to do with both of those things because Groupon is filling up hygiene, wasting hygiene time when it would be much more efficient for the practice to put any other patient in there. Even a recall patient would be better than a Groupon new patient. And so before I expand hygiene, I would cut Groupon and I would fill my one hygienist without Groupon and then I would expand hygiene. Yeah, I, re- I totally agree with you. I think... George, you're like the Bill James of dentistry now. What's Bill James? Bill James, Moneyball, the analytic baseball thing that came out well before it was. That's not his name. Yeah, it is. Bill James? I'm pretty sure. No, it's not. Billy Bean. No, Bill James is the guy who, who um, he invented sabermetrics in baseball. And then okay. Billy Bean adopted it, yeah. Yeah, so yeah, for me, I'm so right. But what do I base all? I'm I'm very big on sports analytics. Like as a hobby, I love sports analytics and I apply that to dentistry. And so for sure, yeah, definitely. You look at the same way they do it in sports, we do it in dentistry. That is 100% a very accurate comparison. That is what we do. And, you know, the one thing I really want to talk about is, well, first, I'm going to make one point. His low hygiene percentage, right, I think has a lot to do with Groupon as well because you're getting a low fee on those that hygiene time. But the other thing is, he does a wide array of procedures. And so his ability to extract treatment out of hygiene seem, and you even talked about it. You know, I, you were talking about low treatment or low hygiene percentage. And then I was like, okay, well, he might have a high diagnosis. And then you said his diagnosis treatment planning was actually spot on. And so those two things are correlated. And a doc like that, when they expand hygiene, they get way busier on their side because for every dollar that goes into hygiene, he gets four more on his side. So his break even on a hygienist is super low. And if his staff costs are low, then, I mean, this guy, is, he's hes setting himself up well to grow his practice aggressively through hygiene. Yeah, and it's an important point that, um, you know, you've turned me on to that it's not just what the hygienist does in her own chair. It's the production you take from it that you wouldn't have already. And if you take that into account, as I said in the interview, one to two patients, you know, you're you're in the the black there. Yeah, 100%. One, one to two patients in an eight-hour day with an extra hygienist would definitely be a break-even point for him. I had no doubt about that, which and is very... A... Go ahead. Go ahead. No, there's a very... you know That's a very counterintuitive topic for most dentists because most dentists are like, well, is it going to fill? And, you know, but I, I agree with the point that you made about Groupon being such a false sense of security. Mm-hmm. You 50 new patients a month, you know, but you're really not getting them and they're really 
I would rather not have those patients than have them. That was a ask me how I know kind of moment. Yeah, I know. Uh, so <laughs> yeah, we both were given the advice to do Groupon and you did it and I turned you off on it. And I think overall, are you happy that you're not doing it anymore? I mean, definitely. I, I like I, when I see patients come back in for the, for the next time, I just see where they came from. There's almost no Groupon patients left. Like yeah. it's just crazy how many came and went. Yeah, they just they fly out of your practice. And, oh yeah, yeah. They, that's not even right. The value of a patient is the repeated visits that you get for free. So the last point I want to make is when you listen to this episode, I was, I love the end of part two. You're just like so quick. You're like, oh, okay, AR looks good. Uh, your treatment planning good. Crown percentage could be better. You know, you're just like, I think sometimes we take for granted how much data we have on these practices. We know everything about them. And that's sometimes just really cool to hear because I hadn't looked at that dashboard before the episode and you just ran me through it. I'm like, cool. I was kind of, I had some questions, you answered them all. And, and the, but the, the, the biggest thing, like what does that offer? And that's where you were very adamant the whole interview. You have a capacity issue. You need to hire another hygienist. You know, we, we, we approached it differently, right? His hygiene capacity needs to increase. You were looking at it at the standpoint of hiring another hygienist. I was looking at it as cutting Groupon to open up more space. Either way, we were, we were talking about the same thing. And adding an assistant, you were very clear the entire time on what needs to get done. And that's what metrics offer. Having a coach, somebody who understands your metrics and looking at them what that offers you is the ability to, he's like, I'm all over the place. Yeah, everyone is all over the place. That's why nobody moves anywhere is because they all get stuck in the doing a hundred things at once and you're really not doing anything. But when you can do one, two, three, four, five things in a row that all move your practice in the same direction, that's when you get the unrealistic or quote unquote unrealistic amount of growth in a short period of time. And so the metrics give you the roadmap. And then you just follow it. And so that to me, this it, to me was very clear as somebody who does this, listening to this episode, the amount of clarity that it's given with a dashboard. Like I think it's remarkable sometimes that we get so much clarity on somebody's business by looking at a computer screen. I mean, it really is. It really is incredible. Um, I mean, I think the key with all these things is you need you need the plan and you need the execution, right? Mm -hmm. So if you if you are just that person that you understand numbers and you can look at your own PBN dashboard and make diagnosis, then you're good on the plan. It's the execution that is difficult, right? Yeah. So that's where the, I see the value as a coach. Like I could talk to him on this podcast, give him a general plan, and now he has it. But that execution is where that where you lean on that coach to to get things done. And that's the integrator in you. That that really stuck out to me as well in this interview. You know, Matt is our integrator at Shared Practices and when if you, we you're going to hear the jargon on the show a lot, integrator. That just means somebody who ensures that shit gets done and we are following through in our plan and we are doing things. So anytime you hear Matt in an interview and the guy will say, "Okay, I need to add implants." Okay, when are you going to do that by? That's always his follow-up. <laughs> and that's very much that quality in Matt that I don't have where he's like, okay, I'm glad we've identified it. What are we going to do next to make sure it happens? And that's Matt's, you know, that's what he gives us at Shared Practices. That is what he gives his clients. And that's something, quite frankly, that I don't have as much as you do or at all. And so I need other people in my life to give me that. But, you know, you very much are great at that and you hold your clients accountable and the deadlines and dates and all that that uh, ensure that stuff gets done. Yeah, I mean it's about it's about making a, a commitment. And if you involve other people in that commitment, it becomes exponentially stronger. Because now you're not just accountable for yourself. You're also have brought in other people in your account. We call them accountability structures. You know, whether yeah. it be a friend, family, or I mean, I, I think ideally a coach, um, to really see you through. And they're gonna be roadblocks along the way. And that's something you bring to the coach. Say, hey, like I, I notice I'm not making any progress in this area of the practice. Like, can we discuss what's going on there? And you'll you'll get new awareness, and from that new awareness, you can shift whatever needs to be shifted, and then now you can have a a, a clear path to to what you're trying to accomplish. Definitely, and you know, I think that's one thing that you do really, really well, and it shows. You know, you're a formally trained life coach. You are not, you know, this is and that your training shows in those types of moments. Nice. Anything else on this one, George? No, I think I think this was great, and you know, this was. I just, I think there's such, there's so many pearls in this one that are hidden. Almost. I feel like they're hidden, you know, but if you look for them, they're there. Yeah. I appreciate that. Um, all right. I hope you guys enjoyed uh, that little back and forth there. 
we'll see everyone next week with a new guest on Practice Underwater. Thanks for listening to another episode of Practice Underwater. We'll see you guys next week. If you're interested in one-on-one coaching with either Dr. George Hariri or Dr. Matt Greeno, our contact emails are in the show notes. And if you're interested in being on Practice Underwater as a guest, where we can look at your practice anonymously, you can go ahead and contact the email in the show notes and follow those directions to get on the show. Thanks, and we'll see you guys next week on Practice Underwater.